Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. I welcome you all to today's session of the Hindu newspaper analysis. I am glad to see a lot of you joining in here right on time and even before time. I am also very happy to see that in the chat you do keep on helping each other. There are many people who keep on answering each other's questions which is a very very good sign going forward. Now, before we begin analyzing the Hindu newspaper for today, there are a few very, very important announcements for all of you. First, as I reminded you yesterday also, today that is Saturday will mark the beginning of a new weekly series. That series is called Polity This Week. Every Saturday at 8 p.m., we will have a live session on our YouTube channel where we will be discussing some of the most important news stories from Indian polities specifically. Then, there is also one other announcement. As I told you earlier as well, we invite all of you to tell us in the comment section of the videos what are the new initiatives that you would like from our side. And a lot of you have been commenting that you want a new series on science and technology, on environment as well. And we have heard all of this, we have heard all your comments and that is why from tomorrow onwards, that is from Sunday, there is another new series coming up for all of you. That will be Science and Environment series. The Science and Environment series will be a fortnightly series, meaning that every alternate Sunday, every alternate Sunday on our YouTube channel here at 8 p.m., we will have this series where we will be discussing the most important news stories from the field of science and tech and environment. So make sure that you keep a reminder for this and you keep on joining. In order for you to not miss any of the sessions, I advise you all, in case you have still not hit the subscribe button, please do hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel so that you can get notifications about all these videos and classes going live. And as always, do keep on coming up with the comments. In the comment section, do keep on telling us how your preparation is going, any advice that you require and also any of the new series that you would like from our end. So let's begin very quickly but before we do that one other announcement i am still seeing that a lot of you are still not attempting the hindu quiz that we do on our telegram channel as you know every single day after the end of this session we have a hindu newspaper quiz on our telegram channel and i want all of you to attempt that quiz as well so that you can check how prepared are you and how much understanding did you gain from these sessions so as soon as we end this session you have to move on to our telegram channel attend that quiz to get the link of our telegram channel you can use the description given in the video now let's begin with the very first article that we have here for you. The first article is based on again the topic of what happened in Tamil Nadu. We discussed it yesterday as well. In Tamil Nadu and in many other states of India, we are still seeing a confrontation between the governor and the chief minister. Just a very quick brief recap of what happened in Tamil Nadu. As you know, <clears throat> at the beginning of every year, when we have the first session of the assembly, at the state level we have the governor who makes an address to the assembly where the governor reads out a speech given to him or her by the state government. In this speech, the governor is expected to talk about the government's programs, the government's achievements and the plans of the government in the coming year. On 9th of January, when Tamil Nadu assembly was having this first session, Tamil Nadu governor Mr. N. Ravi was in the assembly reading out the speech, but he did not read out certain portions of the speech which angered the Tamil Nadu government, more specifically the chief minister, which led to a confrontation. In the end, the governor of Tamil Nadu went out of the assembly even before the national anthem was played. Now, this is not the first time that a confrontation has happened between the governor and the chief minister in India. However, this particular article written by two very, very well-known authors, they are pointing out towards this tradition of giving an address to the parliament. As you know, India follows the Westminster model of parliamentary democracy. Westminster model means the model that the British parliament follows. We follow the same model in most of our parliamentary proceedings. The reason is extremely simple. The reason is that at the time that India became independent, we were very familiar with how British parliament works. Most of our leaders had already been a part of the parliament even before India's independence. 
Because of that familiarity, we decided to go ahead with the Westminster model of government. Now, if you look at the Westminster model of parliamentary democracy, this tradition of the president giving an address in the very first session of the parliament in the beginning of the year actually comes from that tradition only. In England, in UK, that is called the king's address or the king's speech. We are calling it the king's address because now they have a king. Earlier it was called the queen's address when they had the queen. So it is the same thing. So the king's address or the queen's address in UK marks the official beginning of the new session of parliament. And again, it has similar kind of implications as India. The king or the queen is expected to read out a speech given to them by the government and they should not deviate from the speech. In fact, it is a part of Indian constitution as well. If you look at article number 87, that talks about the president's address. Look at article number 176, that talks about the address of the governor. So it's a long-standing tradition. It's not something that started right now. It has been a tradition ever since India became independent. But the problem is, this tradition has been in the news, especially in those states where we have a party which is not the same as the party ruling at the center government level. That is when we have confrontations between the governor and the chief minister. There have been multiple statements given on this topic of the president's address. For example, in 1960, the Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru said that president's address is nothing but a statement of policy of the government. In 1960s, there was a question on whether this president's address or governor's address should be compulsory or it should be optional for the governor to choose from. The Calcutta High Court in 1966 had said that the governor's address is extremely, extremely important. Why? The Calcutta High Court had said that based on the address given by the governor, the members of the assembly come to know about a lot of things about the government's working. Based on that address, the members of the opposition and other members of the assembly can then discuss and even question the achievements of the government. So Calcutta High Court had said that this is extremely, extremely important and this should not be skipped. This is important not just for the government, it is also important for the opposition parties because it gives a chance to the opposition parties to question the government on all their achievements. Now, in UK, they have a very long history, a very long tradition of this king and queen's address. In UK, there has never been any debate like the one that we are having in India. In UK's history, the king or the queen have never deviated from the speech that was given to them. They say the exact same speech that is given to them. In India, however, there have been certain debates. Let me take you back to the Constituent Assembly of India. In the Constituent Assembly of India, there were some members, for example, Professor K.T. Shah. They said that the president should be given the freedom to raise some other issues as well in the speech. The president should read the speech, that is fine. But the president should also be given the freedom that if he or she wants to raise some other issues, he or she should be allowed to do that. But that was not accepted in the Constituent Assembly. Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, for example, was not in favor of this. Dr. B.R. Ambedkar said that no, the president's address is not an address from the discretion of the president. The president is there speaking on behalf of the government. Why? Because as you know, after the president's address, the members of the parliament discuss that address. And when they have to criticize something, they don't criticize the president, they criticize the government. Understand the difference between the two. When the president gives a speech and the members of opposition don't agree with that speech, the members of opposition don't criticize the president for it. They criticize the government for it. So if the government is the one that is getting all the criticism, it is only valid that the government's speech should be read and the president should not speak from his own mind. That is why we had this situation that the president will only speak what exactly is given to him in the speech. If you look at the state level, the governors also are bound by the same. 
the governors also should read out from that speech as per the constituent assembly of india the role of the governor has anyways been in question for a lot of various reasons we discussed exactly the same yesterday as well the role of the governor has changed has evolved over the years we have seen usually in those states which are ruled by political parties which are not at the center government governor plays a very crucial role a very active role a lot of times governors are accused of listening more to the center government as compared to the state governments although the supreme court has time and time again said that this should not happen now i want you or i want to take you rather to a history of this president's address concept this concept of president addressing the parliament or governor addressing the parliament we don't really talk a lot about it it is thus because the topic is in the news we are discussing this so much in detail but usually in indian polity we just read it as a one line fact and we go ahead but it is a very interesting concept article 87 says at the commencement of the first session of each general election to the house of people that is the lok sabha and commencement of the first session of every year the president shall address both houses of the parliament assembled together and inform the parliament of the causes of the summons there is a very interesting fact here as well in the original constitution article 87 had said that the president should address the parliament at the beginning of every session let me repeat what i just said when the original constitution was framed the provision said that the president should address the parliament at the beginning of every session not every year but every session that is at least three times in a year but with the very first constitutional amendment of 1951 this was changed it was thought that president addressing the houses of parliament in every session would be a bit too much let's have this addressal only when we have the new lok sabha having its very first session or at the beginning of each year let's not have it in the beginning of every first session so that was changed the other part of the question is because the governor of tamil nadu has deviated from the speech it has come a lot in the news my question is has president ever done the same in the history of india have we ever had a president that said that no i will not say the speech the answer is no the president has not deviated from such kind of a speech usually presidents abide by whatever speech is given to them although i'll give you one very interesting exception here which is not written here or in this article you all would have heard about shri k r narayanan who was our president when he became the president of india he was also told by the government that we will give you whatever you have to speak in your address to the nation when you talk to the media etc now mr k r narayan was himself a very learned man as a president of india he told the government that if i am talking to the media i cannot just read out the speech that you are giving to me so either i will not talk to the media or i will speak from my own mind you decide whatever you want to do so the government said okay we will not give you a written speech you can talk to media as per your own liking so that has happened in the past but when it comes to addressing the parliament as a president of india no president has deviated from the speech given to them however if you look at the state government at the state level this has happened for example in 1960s more specifically 1969 it happened in west bengal the governor of west bengal in 1969 skipped two paragraphs from the address given to it by the united front government now why was that the case it was a very interesting story there see 1969 the governor of west bengal was appointed by the congress government the congress government at the center appointed this governor the speech that was given to him had two paragraphs this paragraph actually said that the congress was wrong in imposing president's rule in west bengal now just imagine this situation a governor who was appointed by the congress government at the center can that governor in his speech say that congress did an unconstitutional thing by dismissing the west bengal government in the past 
obviously the governor would not want to do that the governor would say no 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 i can't criticize the congress because they are the ones who actually appointed me so the same happened here the governor of west bengal in 1969 skipped two paragraphs from his speech specifically those paragraphs that said that congress ruled government was unconstitutional in dismissing the west bengal government this also led to a lot of criticism of the governor how can governor deviate from the speech etc but just to give you an example there is a precedent of what happened in tamil nadu it has happened in the past that governors have deviated from the speech unlike the president of india now are there other nations also that have the same kind of a tradition we just discussed in uk there is a king or the queen's address in us also there is something called the state of the union address state of the union address so it's an annual address again given by the president of the us where both the houses of the us assemble and the us president talks about the government's achievement and what they want to do what they want to achieve this is called the state of the union however there is a slight difference between the two see understand the president in india and the president in us are two very different entities in india the president is the head of the country not an active part of the government as such yes he is informed about the government policies yes he signs on the government bills etc all that is fine but president is not really an active part of the government here in us for however president is the head of the government also in india that is not the case in india prime minister is the head of the government so in us we do have the concept of the state of the union address which can be equated to the president's address but it happens every single year and also it is not the same as we actually have in case of india now before i go on to the second topic for today the second important article from science hunting let me see if i have any question here um i have a question is there any provision that is mandatory for the cabinet to prepare the presidential address no the cabinet is not bound to include or exclude anything in the presidential address that is not the case then i have a question can governor or president ask to make changes in the written speech given to him before presenting in the house they can certainly ask they can certainly as you know whatever advice is given to president or governor they can send it back once but if the same advice is repeated they would have no choice but to abide by that then i'll take one more question and then i'll end it uh, ayush has a question so us president speaks on his own yes because us president is again the head of the government also understand this in india head of the government is a prime minister head of the country is a president so head of the government gives a speech to head of the country in us it's the same entity so it is a us president only who has the speech i don't know what it perfect let's go ahead the second important article i want to discuss from here is from the field of science and technology that is about a new problem that has emerged in the past few years the problem of deep fake i hope all of you would have at least heard the term deep fake now what exactly is deep fake let's try and understand it is a technology with the help of which a lot of people impose fake face or voice of someone else for example you might see a video where you see a very famous personality saying something in his or her own voice but that might not be true that is called deep fake when you go so deep into a technology that it becomes very difficult to identify whether it is a fake personality or a real personality that becomes a concept of deep fake with increasing advances in the technology increasing advances in artificial intelligence machine learning deep fake has become so good that it is now becoming almost impossible almost impossible to actually identify whether the person is right or wrong i'll give you a very simple example okay let's try and understand this let's try to take this example let's say you get a video call on your whatsapp okay and you see in your video call it is your mom or your father okay and they are saying they are completely talking to you normally and they say that i need some help uh, can you please transfer 50000 rupees if you are earning you have a good salary you won't mind you say okay mom or dad i'll transfer the money to you right and they'll say that i am in the middle of an accident or i am in the middle of the road i need this money can you please transfer you have 
no point to question whether it is right or wrong. You have this video call, it is your mom, your dad, you can identify them, the voice is there, the face is there. You will not question them, you will just answer the money. But before you know it, you will get to know that was a deep fake. That was not a real call. They imposed the face on someone else, they actually faked the voice as well. And this has happened recently. I'll give you this example. Recently, we had a situation where a CEO of a UK energy company got a phone call, a video call from his boss in Germany. And his boss in Germany told the CEO that you have to transfer some money to the parent company. The sum was about 2,20,000 euros you have to transfer. It was a video call. Just imagine when your boss in the company is saying you have to transfer funds to their company from your company. You will do that. And the voice was his, the face was his and the CEO had no option but to transfer the money. And it turned out to be actually a fake call. There have been multiple such videos that have come around. For example, a few months back, there was a video of the president of Ukraine. Actually, the video said that he is telling his soldiers to surrender. But again, that was also fake. He did not ask his soldiers to surrender. But that was the video that was being circulated. It seemed like a very, very real video. All of that is because of AI and machine learning becoming so good at their job that they are now able to replicate something entirely that they want. And that is what is leading to problems all around the world. There are multiple examples in there. For example, you see recently, Taiwan has also understood the fact that China can actually meddle in their elections. As you know, Taiwan is a robust democratic country. They have proper election unlike China. They fear that China might interfere in their elections. China might want their supporters to win in Taiwan so that it becomes easier for them to overtake Taiwan. So Taiwan recently passed a law saying banning deep fake videos or images or punishing people who do that. China has also passed the same kind of a law here. So there have been multiple examples of these deep fakes actually going around. In India also you see so many videos of celebrities, politicians etc. going around saying things which they have not said in real life. All that comes under the category of deep fake. Now the authors here say because this has become such a big problem, it is time for the government of India to realize this. Before it becomes too late, we must pass a law against it. Now in India, right now, we do not have any specific law against deep fake technology. We do have the IT Act of 2000, the Information Technology Act. We do have the Representation of People Act that talks about not spreading misleading information in the context of elections, etc. But no law in India specifically talks about deep fake technology or specifically talks about impersonating a very famous personality. So the authors say that this is a time that we should be one step ahead rather than waiting for this kind of a thing to happen in India. We should go ahead and learn from other nations who have already passed the law. Which other nations that have already passed the law? Taiwan and China. I gave you examples written in this article. I will give you some other examples which are not written in this article. Let's talk about European Union. European Union, in fact, realized this problem very soon and they put the responsibility of stopping deep fakes on technology companies themselves. European Union has passed a law saying that technology companies such as Google, Meta, Twitter, all of these have the responsibility of stopping and countering deep fakes on their platforms. If they are not able to do that, if they are not able to stop the problem of deep fakes, then we would impose a fine on them. The fine can be up to 6% of their annual global turnover, which can be a huge, huge amount. These companies have a global turnover in billions and billions of dollars. 6% of that can be a huge cost. So European Union has imposed this code that you have to, as companies, you have to take responsibility of stopping this problem. We even have this kind of a law in US as well. The US introduced a deep fake task force act to counter the deep fake technology. In India, as we discussed, there is no specific law for deep fakes. We do have certain acts, IT Act, which talks about these kind of issues, but they have to be 
amended to include these issues of deep fakes in order for the law to become even more effective in case of India. The next important news from today's Hindu newspaper is from the economics section. A news that unfortunately we have become quite used to that is the increasing trade deficit between India and China. The headline says that India's trade deficit with China has now gone beyond 100 billion dollars which is a big big concern for the government of India. The article says as per the latest numbers India China bilateral trade has now reached close to 136 billion dollars out of which India's exports to China are very low. India's exports to China are only 17 and a half billion dollars. In exchange, if you see China importing to India, their products coming to India have actually increased and gone very close to 115, 117 billion dollars. Meaning that right now there is a trade deficit of 100 billion dollars. Now there are two big concerns that India has. First big concern that China's exports to India are increasing. We are buying more and more things from China. But to counter that India's products to China are not increasing. In fact, our exports to China fell from 28 billion dollars to 17 and a half billion dollars. So at a time that we are saying that the Chinese technology is bad, we should have Atmanirbhar Bharat, we are focusing on make in India, etc. But at the same time, at the back end, if you see the trade between the two countries, it is at an all-time high and even the trade deficit is at an all-time high. The problem is that there are a lot of things for which India is dependent on China and there is no alternative right now. For example, we are dependent on China when it comes to APIs, Active Pharmaceutical Ingredients. Now what exactly is this? Active Pharmaceutical Ingredients are the ingredients using which the medicines are made. As you know, India is a generic pharmacy of the world. We make a lot of medicines and supply it throughout the world. But the components to manufacture those medicines, that is the APIs, they come in mainly from China. We are also dependent on China when it comes to electrical and mechanical machinery. Most of our electronics still come from China, although there have been a lot of companies that are now trying to manufacture the electronic products in India. But a lot of that still comes from China, auto component, medical supplies, all of that is coming from China. Now, there are two ways to look at it. One way to look at it is that yes, it is bad, we should not do this. But you cannot just blame the government for their policies. Understand this from individual point of view. Let's say you go to the market. And this is a very real example. Let's say you go to the market right now and you have to buy a washing machine or an air conditioner, refrigerator, whatever. Let's say you buy a washing machine. Now, the washing machine when you go to buy, there are two options. One option, it's a Chinese company. It's a made in China product. That washing machine will be 25,000. Okay, now in place of that you have an Indian washing machine made in India, exactly the same features, exactly everything remains the same, there is no difference, but that will cost you 30,000 rupees. Now tell me very honestly, which washing machine would you go for? Very honestly, tell me which washing machine would you go for? Would you stand there in the shop and say, no, 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 I will not buy made in China products. I will only buy Indian products even if I have to give more money. Would you do that? No, you will not do that because your thinking will be, let me save money. Let me save money because 5,000 can be very handy. Because in a developing nation, that has always been the problem. In a developing nation, in the market, people are very price sensitive. So we are price sensitive when we go to buy air conditioner, when we go to buy AC, when we go to buy refrigerator. Our concern is not where has it been manufactured. Our concern is which is the cheapest, right? And if you're getting the same thing, at different costs, you'll obviously buy the cheaper one and think that no government will do something. What can I do right now? And when at the end of the year, the trade numbers come out, we think, oh, we are buying so many things from China. Very bad. But it is because the common consumer is buying those things. So you have to understand the blame cannot be always with the government. It has to be individuals who are actually buying those products. And it is a problem with every developing country. Because in a developing country, the people would obviously have to go with the cheapest possible products. It is different in developed nations. And that is why 
that is why you see if you look at for example india japan trade you will see india japan trade is not very high why because at the same time you will all the shopkeeper will say sir i have a japanese washing machine also that is 45000 rupees will you buy that very few people will buy that although you know at the back of your mind the japanese technology will be the best one you know at the back of your mind japanese technology will run for longer years it will be better but you think oh 45000 is too much let me save money that is why obviously the indian japan trade will not be that high because when their products come into our country they are sold at a higher cost it's as simple as that and that is why because we are a very price sensitive market a very price sensitive country which will only change when the per capita income increases because right now we have a per capita income which is very close to only 2000 dollars we can't compare ourselves with other nations which have a much higher per capita income i'll just give you an example if india's per capita income is close to 2200 dollars with china it is close to or over 10000 dollars with taiwan their per capita income is close to 50000 dollars so you can't compare how indians will buy products as compared to how a taiwan person will buy products so on and so forth that is why the trade deficit cannot just go away immediately you can ban chinese apps all you want but at the end of the day the people would have to buy products which are very cost effective and that is why despite all the uh, different types of initiatives that we have taken if you see the trade with china has only been the same or in fact increased over the years yes you can say that we should give boost to make in india we should give boost to our own manufacturing but understand these things take time you can't expect an overnight explosion in our manufacturing sector so that everything is becomes made in india that doesn't happen it takes time over the years so yes gradually we might have a mindset that i want to buy only make in india things gradually we might have a mindset that okay our manufacturing in india would have to be better but again you cannot expect this to happen overnight now there is a very interesting difference between our trade with india and between our trade with china and the us with us also india trade is close to 100 billion dollars slightly more than 100 billion dollars but the good part is with the us we have a trade deficit on the opposite side in fact we have a trade surplus meaning that we export more things to us as compared to what we import but with china that is opposite let me give you some examples of the things that we import from china so majorly we import electrical machinery television image sound recorders basically everything regarding electric and electronics nuclear reactors organic chemicals plastics etc all of that we mostly import from china what do we export to china we export to china mainly our minerals organic chemicals mineral fuel oil mineral wax iron and steel cotton etc now the problem is because we are heavily dependent on china for these kind of things like api etc the problem is if our relationship with china deteriorates for any reason we would have to pay a big economic cost for example see what happened between europe and russia because europe was so highly dependent on russia for their oil and gas that now because of the war europe is now running after other alternatives trying to see how can they buy gas and they have to pay a higher price similarly in case of india because we are dependent on china for a lot of our imports if the situation becomes bad with china we would have to find much expensive alternatives that can be very very difficult there is also one very interesting thing here and i all want all of you to pay attention here for just 2 minutes do you see the list of things that we import versus what we export there is a very interesting trend here just try and understand this trend what are we importing from china we are importing mainly electrical electronic goods right meaning the goods that are made in their factories please try to understand this we are importing what is made in their factories and what are we exporting we are exporting minerals we are exporting ores we are exporting in organic chemicals meaning that we are exporting something which is not made in our factory but our raw materials so we are extracting our raw materials and we are exporting that to china china is using the same raw material 
to make an electrical product and then sell it back to India at a much higher cost. Do you see what is happening here? India, rather than selling something which is made in our markets, we are exploiting our own mineral resources, selling it to China. China is using the same as the input. They are then translating it into a much higher cost product in their market, selling it back to India at a much higher cost. So what is happening? China is not exploiting its own mineral resources. China has its own mineral resources, but they are thinking, why to take it out? Let's just buy it from India. Once their sources are over, then we will tell India, now you buy from us at a much higher cost. So that is usually how we have to understand that the government strategic policy, the government foreign policy has to change over the years. That is a problem that we are seeing in India-China relations as well. Let me see if there are a few questions from here and then we'll move ahead to the next topic that we want to discuss. Um, I have a question. Is there any other country apart from China through which we can import APIs? We can, but again, the question remains the same. There are other countries that will offer us, but at a higher price. So now, what decision would the government make? Would the government buy from China at a cheapest cost so that the medicines become cheap and people can buy cheap medicines in India? Or we go ahead buy API at a higher cost from Japan? So again, the cycle remains the same. It is again, at the end of the day, the issue of cost. Then I have a question, reason for decline in export from India, because as you see here, India mainly exports mineral resources here. So our export to China really depends upon how many minerals can we actually ex extract from our sources. That is where the problem starts. Also, because, uh, because China right now is going through an economic downturn, because a lot of lockdown activities have been happening, so maybe they don't require as many minerals as they required earlier from India. Then I have uh, another question. How can we address this to manage our resources? Again, see, it's not that it's a secret that I, I, that I only know this problem and you only know this problem. Bureaucrats, the people who are running the government are much smarter than us, so they also know this problem. I won't say that I only know the problem and government doesn't know it. They also know it. It's not a secret. The point is that nothing can change overnight. You have to understand this. It doesn't change overnight. Yes, the government has been taking certain steps, giving a boost to our manufacturing sector, giving more skills to the people in India. But again, understand something. India can never be China. In fact, no country can be China. Because see, the way that their country, their government works is very unfair to their people. See, I'll give you a very simple example. When the COVID-19 began, China had this policy that if let's assume there was a mother who became COVID positive and the mother had a two month old child, the mother was taken away by the government and the child was separated. The government said, we will not let you see the child. We will keep the child for 15 days. When you become negative, we will send the child back to you. As simple as that, no questions asked. Do you think that kind of a policy can ever happen in India? Can the government say we are taking away the mother, we are taking away the child, now you go, you become negative, then we'll bring you the child back. Would it ever happen in India? No. The way that Chinese government works, the way that Chinese government applies their policies is very, very different. If the Chinese government says that you have to work for 12 hours a day, full stop. If you work even one minute less than 12 hours a day, you will not be kept alive. Do you think the same can happen in India? Obviously, no. It can't happen in India. So the outcome that Chinese economy and Chinese government has can never be equated to why we are not having it, why other governments don't have it. Because let's hope that we don't have it. Because our way of functioning, our democracy is very different as compared to their country, their Chinese country, Chinese economy. They have a one-party government. They have a one-party political system. People don't have an option to say to the Communist Party that we'll vote for some other party next time. No, they can't. And that is why the Communist Party can follow whatever policies they want. So if they are giving subsidies to people, if they are forcing their people to work longer hours, we can't do the same in our country. So yes, we can improve. Yes, we can give more skills to our people. Yes, we can give a boost to our manufacturing sector. But it's not that easy to understand this. For anyone in India to, or for a government in India 
to establish a factory it will take a long time to acquire the land it will take a long time to convince the people in china if they want to open up a factory tomorrow everyone will be forced to go out of their houses and factory will be built in 10 days why because government doesn't listen to people in india government will have to convince people announce this announce that then you will have to see if there are activists that are coming in then the case will go to supreme court then after five years we will see if the factory can be set up or not but in china that is not the case it happens overnight so when you say oh china is such a great country they are building a metro station in 10 days highways in 10 days understand this they are doing this because they can't have any opposition from the people let's go ahead the next topic is from the first page the main page of the hindu newspaper that is the supreme court making a statement they are saying that the government has to take the responsibility to end hate speech the supreme court is saying that they are worried about the increasing trend of hate speech in india they are saying that we are specifically worried about what happens in our news channels. They are saying that in the news channels, we see a lot of anchors driving their own agenda and the government is not taking enough action. Without taking any specific name of a news channel, they said that the news debates that you see these days, where people without any proof put allegations, all of that is in the definition of hate speech. The Supreme Court judges said that, for example, the recent Air India case, and I'm sure all of you would have read about that, the Air India case where a person has been accused of urinating on a woman on a flight in Air India. Now the point is that yes, it's a bad thing. It's a very, uh, it's a thing that you can't even talk about. But the fact is, as per the Supreme Court judges, this is a case that is still being heard. The person is an under trial. Nothing has been proven so far. But even before that, you see the people coloring that person as a demon as someone who is who has committed a terror crime in news channels if you see the kind of names that is given to that accused the supreme court says that it is a very worrying trend we cannot have a situation where the news channels and news media and anchors can say anything that they want the government has to take steps in order to end this hate speech just to increase their TRPs, we cannot allow the news to become a medium to peddle any information that they want. The responsibility lies with both the government also and the responsibility lies with the media also to self-regulate as well. I'll give you an example. For example, recently, the Malayalam News Channel's Media One TV was banned by the Ministry of Information and Technology because of their news coverage and it is not happening for the first time they were banned earlier as well so there are multiple examples of the news channels being banned there are multiple examples of the news channels actually peddling fake information you would have seen just a couple of days back in fact there was a news report that the government has shortlisted certain youtube channels that spread fake news and the government wants to ban that but the reach of TV is much longer. The reach of TV is much wider in India. So that also has to be taken into consideration as per the Supreme Court. Now I wanted to give you example of an organization. It is not a government organization. It's an organization made by the media houses themselves to regulate this issue. That organization is called News Broadcasting and Digital Standards Authority. So it's a body set up by the news channels themselves. They have come together to set up a body which will regulate the working of news channels. So if, for example, I am a television viewer, if I have a problem with a news channel, I can go and complain to this authority saying that these news channels are spreading fake news, etc. They will then take up the complaint and they will ask the news channels to report. But the problem is they are not a government authority. So they can't take a lot of strict action. The only thing that they can do is that they can actually impose a fine of up to 1 lakh rupees and nothing more than that. For news channels, 1 lakh rupees is not really a very big amount. The Supreme Court says that it is the responsibility of the government, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, INB Ministry specifically, has to ensure that they take stringent steps. Just a self-regulating body which is run by the organizations in the news themselves will not suffice. These were the important articles from today's Hindu newspaper that we had to take up today. There are a couple of practice questions. Apart from these practice questions, I would also want one other thing from you. I want all of you to tell in the comment section of the video, 
how do you think the government of India can actually stop our reliance on China? Let me repeat. I want all of you to tell in the comment section, what do you think can the government of India do to stop our reliance on China for importing a lot of these things? I want you to write this so that we can learn from each other's answers because a lot of times you might have an idea in your mind and some other person might have some other idea. So let's share that in the comment section and let's see if we can learn from each other as well. These are two practice questions that I have. First, striking a balance between independence of news channels and their right to free speech may form the very basis of a, of a safe and robust society. Comment. Second, does increasing trade gulf with China point towards ineffective trade policies of the Indian government? Critically analyze both these questions. You can answer within 250 words each. I want a lot of you to ensure that you give these comments. As I told you, tell us how do you think we can stop our lines on China? Also, you can use our student portal to write these answers, give each other feedback. The link to student portal also will be in the description of the video. Thank you so much for joining in. We'll see each other once again in the Hindu News Analysis. Don't forget to join us every single day live at 10 a.m. And do hit that subscribe button as well. Thank you so much for joining in. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Jai Hind.